Aloha. I'm Art Vento, President and CEO of the Maui Arts and Cultural Center. On behalf of the Makohana, we wish good health and mind, body, and spirit to you, our Maui community. Before we can stand together again, we must now stand apart so we are closed to the public. But remember, this is only an intermission. We look forward to the day when the Mac can welcome you back to enjoy the healing power of the arts through live performances, arts and education programs, and all the free community events that the Mac has to offer. When it can happen on Maui, it will happen at the Mac. Now through the generous support of the County of Maui and the Mayor's Office on Economic Development, the Mac has created Live at the Mac, a series of virtual and live events featuring Hawaii-based artists and diverse art forms. The series is designed to bring much needed opportunities for many artists, all originating from here, your Maui Arts and Cultural Center. While we remain closed to the public on a daily basis, the MAC remains committed that when it can happen safely on Maui, it will happen at the MAC. Arts and Cultural Center opened in 1994 as the culmination of a long-standing dream of Maui residents to build a world-class gathering place for the performing and visual arts. The Center's art and craft program began as a commissioning process using 1% of the overall construction budget for site-specific works of art for the permanent collection. The program was a collaboration between the architect, John Hara, the Arts Advisory Committee, and the Commissioned Artists and Craftspeople. Aloha, I'm Hokulani Holt, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Maui Arts and Cultural Center, and more specifically, here in front of the PA. So this PA was created back in 1994. It actually began probably a little before that, but it was in 1994 that we finally brought the community together. We were able to go and gather the rocks up here in what is known as Nawai'eha, Waikapu, Wailuku, Waiehu, and Waihe'e in order to hand carry the rocks from the river onto the trucks and then to have them trucked down here. The community definitely came together for that. It was our desire that these rocks travel and be handled in the best way that we could. We didn't want machinery marring their beauty at all. So hand carried them onto trucks and then trucked it back down here to the Maui Arts and Cultural Center. Prior to the beginning of the laying of the rocks for this pa, ceremonies were done to lay the four cornerstones, one from each one of the rivers that were, that are Navai Eha. So ceremony was done to lay the cornerstone and then the community came to carry the rocks off of the trucks and back down to where the setters could set the rock in place. We have had storytelling, we have had hula, we have had music, we have had talk story lectures, all related to Hawaiian culture here at the PA. I have always said, it is not how much you use it, but that it is used appropriately. And that is what happens here. We firmly believe that whatever you do on the pa, your mana is left behind. And the mana of that activity is left behind. So that means the next person that comes to use it draws the mana from the pa and adds their own to it as well. It's a very Hawaiian thing, this idea of reciprocation. We reciprocate mana into and out of this very space. When it was dedicated, it was dedicated with ceremonies. Different kumuhula from Maui came and sat, had ava ceremony when it was dedicated for use. So 
All of the things that would have been needed to make this place special has been done. Artists who were finalists met with members of the Art Commission and others from the community to hear the history of the site and the hopes for the proposed Maui Arts and Cultural Center. Having an architectural model of the proposed building helped me visualize the five openings for the monumental entrance gates, two as fixed panels, three paired open gates in the middle where people would enter. I began to conceive of netting as the image for this commission. It was so important for me to listen, to learn about the chosen site that had once been a fishing village, and to think about what might be appropriate for the entrance to this new center. Talking with Native Hawaiians, the title came to me. They told me that stars, especially the constellation of Makali'i or the Pleiades, were thought of as nets in the sky, that the stars were like knots in a net. The open space between lines of the net was called Maka, the eye of the net. The rising of the Makali'i Pleiades marks the beginning of the Makahiki season and the Hawaiian New Year. Once my Gate Commission proposal was accepted, I approached David Hamilton from Tasmania, a visiting professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. David was head of the Pilot Art Foundry at the University of Tasmania in Launceston. No foundry in Hawaii was large enough to make the gates. David and his team determined that from my full-scale models of the gates made out of polystyrene foam cloth, they would sand cast the gate panels, a foam vaporization process, figuring out how to do this using the full-scale drawings I sent with each panel. After the casting, lamp black patina brought out the depth and detail on the surface of the cast aluminum. The panels, two and a half tons of metal, were shipped from Tasmania to Maui and successfully installed in 1994, after three years devoted to this project. I remember when I did get the commission before the center was built, one of my fondest memories is we all met up at the park and we looked down on like a pile of dirt and we were trying to imagine what, what, what was ahead of us, what were we going to do, you know, and it was just this vision that all these people had to create this wonderful space and give uh, artists opportunities to just like uh, press the envelope as far as what, what medium that an artist normally worked in, they were kind of trying to get us outside of that. So first of all, the, I uh, did an initial drawing and then I had to make an actual uh, model of this area uh, to scale. And my dad actually helped me do that. And you know, I was in Pennsylvania visiting and we built a foam core model of this area. And then I had to make this to scale mural and slip it in there. So then the next process was, you know, to buy all the supplies. I had to like sandwich a lot of the pieces together and make them thicker than they were for what I wanted because I wanted it to kind of be a dimensional relief sort of a thing. I didn't want to go, I mean, they liked the idea of a chunky sort of sculptural piece, but to put that like on a wall was the challenge. So how am I going to get, you know, that kind of feeling of a relief? sculptural feel, but yet have it on the wall. So, so that's why the pieces are all kind of raised off of the wall. What makes children love it? Maybe because we all are, you know, really kids. So we don't ever really grow up. It's, it's everything around us that grows up. And so we're all kids inside. And I think that we forget to have fun and we forget to let ourselves be uh, happy and, and, to, and to be in touch with our imagination or to be in touch with, with what brings us joy daily. My intention is always pretty much to uh, get some reaction and usually a positive one is good. So I think color is the, uh, the glue that sticks 
happiness together for a lot of people. And so the visual part of seeing color and, and having a relationship with that color is what makes people feel something. And so it, the gift the, of being able to take color and put it together in a lot of different ways so that it works and creates the feeling that you want is, is the challenge. This work, titled Unknown Shores by the late Michael G. B. Tom, draws from the ancient Greek myth about Daedalus and Icarus who were imprisoned on the Isle of Crete. Daedalus, the father, made wings of bird feathers and wax so they could escape and fly high into the sky towards freedom. Although he was warned, his son Icarus flew recklessly close to the sun and melted his wings as he fell to the sea and drowned. The artists made the installation by pounding and welding copper and brass, and it spans 76 feet in length. When the Maori Arts and Cultural Centre first came to my attention, um, Pondi Okauchi was doing his wonderful, wonderful things. Yeah, I heard that there was going to be a competition um, for this particular space in the lobby of the theatre. Of course, no one had any idea what it looked like then. But uh, actually, I did have an idea of what it looked like. I knew it was a curved wall in a, in a not very big space, you know. So I uh, decided to submit something. There was, it was uh, I heard there was something like 200 people applied for this particular space. And um, I thought at the time, well, everyone is going to do a big painting or whatever, you know. And it would be really good if uh, someone did on the wall uh, artwork small enough so that if there's 300 people in this lobby, which there always would be, you know, uh, that they could actually see it and go up and look at it. It was a solid eight months painting because there was a year of, or, or must have been almost a year, of getting photographs, going everywhere and going to all the events and this and that and everything, getting photographs. And, uh, but there, it was eight solid months of painting. In, in between which I did a practically solid year's work of what I usually do because we had to make a living after all. When I first got here, I was, I was a brush painter all the time in Europe and everywhere else all over the world, I was a brush painter. And I got here and I was painting away and uh, a, another artist, Joyce Clark is her name, a uh, wonderful artist, she, I used to go down and watch her paint, and she painted with a palette knife. One of these, exactly. And she said, here, have this, try it. And you know, I started to use that, and I've used them ever since. And I've used it ever, that's 47 years I've been using this shape, and I don't use, don't use, rarely use brushes at all anymore. Every painting on these walls is done with that, not this palette knife because they wear out, but with this shape and size palette knife. In doing this work, um, it, it, did, it did a lot more than I thought it would as far as learning about the people here, uh, the people on Maui, Hawaiian people in general, or the people in Hawaii in general, were throwing snowballs, and these kids were having a great time up there. You know, um, it, it's one of the really unique things about about Maui. This was one of the first ones. I think this was the second painting I did. It was unfinished, and I, uh, when I got, you know, I was going with all the paintings and everything, and I'd look at that and I'd say. Hmm, I should finish it. And then I'd think, no, I shouldn't. I shouldn't do anything to it. It was done. It's how I finished it, and that's it. 
Uh, this is another my favorite of mine. I've always liked this one, the motorcycles. That's Toys for Tots, you know. They did this Toys for Tots things. I got a lot of the uh, people who actually do all the work here, who show us around, and they're, they're wonderful people, and I had to get them. They're kind of like a signature to the whole piece. The collection includes fine art, contemporary craft, and traditional cultural art forms. The artists were encouraged to take risks through their creative process, to draw from the inspiration of Maui, and to research the cultural history of the site. My first impression of the Maui Arts and Cultural Center was the way the architecture fits so nicely into the environment. You know, the buildings were classical yet contemporary, and also the proximity to the ocean and the mountains. I remember walking across the street to the ocean on my first visit there and seeing the harbor with all the boats and canoes. And I thought, you know, this place has a long history of ocean-going vessels. I thought that was something I wanted to have in my piece. Coincidentally, during the time I was working on the proposal for the bench, a friend of mine uh, offered me some big blocks of oak that were once used to shore up ships and dry dock. So I acquired them and um, came up with the idea of connecting the pieces to um, make the required length using the traditional Japanese joinery that I had learned as an apprentice in Kyoto, Japan in the 80s during my five-year apprenticeship there. After cutting the joinery and fitting the blocks together, I drew and chiseled out an outline of a boat on the top surface of the bench. Instead of carving the entire piece like a vessel. I wanted it to feel as if uh, the boat was starting to emerge from the block. Probably influenced from a piece I had seen of Michelangelo's late work, where the figure seemed to be emerging from a block of marble. Kane Vahine, I thought, was so appropriate for a title when I discovered that there actually was a word, Kane Vahine, that had been used in ancient Hawaiian culture. And it represented this sense that there was this, uh, this belief in the unity of all life, and male and female. And to see that that was at the heart of the culture that we live in now made it so, so abundantly clear to me what the theme of this, of this painting should express. I go to a point up where the thoughts just are brushed away. I did not do preparatory sketches for this painting but I did not do it as an abstract expressionism, which I often paint, but it wasn't following the accidents of the brush and the oil. However, it seemed that what flowed from the brush to the canvas seemed to go exactly where it should go. I wanted that painting to speak for itself, that its colors should express, wow, what should black express? To one person, it's, it's negative, it's death, it's, for another person, it's the night sky. To me, it's one of the most lovely, beautiful colors I play with. <laughs> I used uh, oil paint. In a, in a way that quite radical, using gobs of paint with a palette knife 
and then coming in and doing very fine uh, washes. The combination of the washes and the thick uh, impasto, as close as you could get to the strength, the inner strength, if you will, of nature and of what we see around us. As I was planning this, I kept thinking about what was going to happen as people came up the stairs and how did this reveal itself and the fact that it reveals itself from the, from the bottom up, if you will. It grows there, it's very organic. And I think uh, considering that so many people have stopped and looked at it and been influenced by it, I think perhaps it may influence generations to come. Uh, which would be really nice, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was actually called in to a meeting um, and the selection committee was having a difficult time um, with pieces for the grills. Uh, they couldn't find anything that was quite working. so. An idea came up in which they said, what if we work with kids and have those works be the, the inspiration, the uh, template for these pieces? And so I was asked, would you be interested in going to schools, uh, teaching kids, working with kids, uh, and facilitate this whole process? So I said, sure. And we decided on three different schools, uh, Waihe'e Elementary, Cam Third School Elementary and um, Hana Elementary. And uh, part of that was geographic. We wanted to capture uh, all parts of the island. Um, we decided to go at first, second, and third graders. The first thing we wanted to do working with the kids uh, was we wanted to be able to have just technically the works connect to the edge. Uh, and what I mean by that was we knew we were working in a square uh, shape for the grills and technically the works needed to connect to the edge just to be able to uh, be there. So with the kids we had them first draw these squares and then we had them when they draw, when they drew their images, connect to the edges. Second part was we wanted um, to have people in there to have human beings. So those are the two basic elements, real simple, squares with human beings inside. And then from there, we just played with different ideas and uh, I, I let the kids go. So after working with the kids, we wound up with roughly about 200 pieces to, to select from. Um, it was pretty obvious about seven of those really stood out. And um, out of those seven, one or two uh, were pretty much done deals. They were just, they were it. And then from there, it was looking at what would make the best combination out of those three. So I think we, we saw two and we said, oh, they were different, they would work with, what's the third piece that would work within that set? Uh, and that didn't take that long. It was, it was within a few hours we realized this is it. Uh, and then when you put them side by side, it, it just flowed really nicely. Their variety, very different. Getting involved in this process is, is great in, in a lot of different ways. It, it gave me the sense that I could start to work in first public work uh, and also sculptural work, which I'd never done before. So it's very different in that way. Um, I think also uh, working in this collaborative, uh, collaborative way in, uh, in, in the sense that I, the part that I did was really part one uh, of, of two parts. Uh, my part was really facilitating creating the images. The, those images then would be handed off to Bill Little who was the fabricator. So working with a fabricator uh, was something I'd never done. When they decided to go with steel, it was a sure fit. I accepted it after I reviewed everything. That there was never any doubts. You know, we're going to do this. The, the, here's the thing that I had to overcome: the fact that it's not my art. So I dealt with that from the get-go because I've I've had philosophy on who's making what and where the ideas are coming from. 
So all I became then was a, a practitioner, and the practitioner would be the execution of the steel. It was an agreement what we're gonna do, and I took, I did the tracing. I did, I put the lines in the steel, and I used a, a reflective type line. So it's almost like a crayon, but it's very small. So when I was burning, I could uh, come right to that line. That zigzag took a little while to get going, but once I got it going, that rhythm, I used that rhythm through the whole thing. As a sculptor, I work in a three-dimensional mode because it's, it's an object in space. This is an object in space, but it's like a painting in a way, but you re we only get to see a two-dimensional read. Some people call them grills, or they call them this or that, but they are power. They get to be more powerful when I come here because I see them and I know that the thousands and thousands of people that have looked at them. The first phase that I remember, the trench was dug, yeah? The trench was dug and then um, the rocks was piled up here. We had to put up the forms. The forms was like high, you know, you can see the wall. Because this wall is about a, a foot to a foot and a half deep. The base is like four feet and the top is three. Yeah, what I remember, yeah. I still got a good memory, yeah? <laughs> Actually, it's tilted in. From, from four feet at the base, tilted in. It's, uh, it's an angle, it's an angle wall. I think they did that for mostly for strength, yeah? And uh, strength, mostly for strength and beauty, I guess, yeah. I'm the type of person that any kind of rock uh, you bring here, I can find the beauty. I'll find the beauty, I'll find the face, and I know where it's going. Every rock has a home for it, yeah? Every rock has a form, and, and I was taught this way. Once you pick up the rock, do not throw it back down. Sooner or later, you're gonna pick it up again, okay? That's twice you gotta pick up. Some guys, even three or four times, you gotta pick up the rocks, yeah? So when you pick it up, there's a home for it. Especially for this long distance. You can walk the rock all day long and put it somewhere instead of throwing them back down. But not the big ones, <laughs> you cannot you get okay with the big ones here. This rock is kinda heavy, it's very porous. This rock is from uh, Pukalani. Every time when I teach people, I, I tell them this way. There is six people teaching you how to set rocks, okay? As I progress in this uh, profession, you know, I, I went on my own a lot of times. I got scolding. You know, you, you, when you learn some the basics, stick to the basic and improve, yeah? And improve from there, yeah? People nowadays, yeah? When I tell them that six people teaching you, I had six teachers at different times. Yeah? Not, uh, one of them was my uncle and one of them was my brother. Sometimes when you do something that is very important to the, you know, the culture, it's better. Pandi Yokouchi was my good friend, yeah? took care of me, put up there, the last rock up there somewhere. Called him and said, Pandi, you want to tell everybody he built a wall? Come down now. And we put that last rock on there. Yeah. The most recent addition to the collection is a cast bronze sculpture of Masaru Pandi Yokouchi, the founding chairman of the center. He believed the art should be available to all and envisioned the center as a place where the entire community could come together. This work was created by Sean K. L. Brown, a highly accomplished native Hawaiian artist whose monumental sculptures are visible in public spaces throughout the state of Hawaii. The Maui Arts and Cultural Center stands as a testament to Pundi's visionary spirit and the continued support of many people who have attended countless performances, exhibits, and cultural and educational opportunities since 1994. These permanent works in the collection assure us that inspiration from the arts will always be here for generations to come. Mm -hmm.